Heavenly Father, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. Amen. I don't know how many of you are involved with social media. Uh, this group in this room is perhaps not completely representative of the population, but if you are not, your children, your grandchildren, your carers or nurses, your taxi drivers, your shopkeepers, your fellow dog walkers, all of those people often are. The number of different social media platforms has proliferated. Facebook, of course, began it all, then Twitter and Instagram and the ubiquitous, ubiquitous YouTube. That's very hard to say, ubiquitous YouTube. And now we, of course, have dozens more. I have to confess that I mostly use Facebook, though I do have both an Instagram and a Pinterest page. And a young person said to me, Facebook is for grannies. But I am a granny. One of the ways that social media, media has educated me personally is to expose me to a level of hostility and downright hatred that exists in our society that I didn't know was there. I suppose I've always moved in the rarefied atmosphere of the church where the hatred and hostility is expressed in less open terms. The latest furore is the conversation around Australia Day or Invasion Day, if you prefer. Now, those of you who are my friends on Facebook will know that I am a supporter of changing the day. I myself have been aware of the tension ever since the bicentennial, when we went with hundreds of thousands, accompanied by our small children, to Sydney Cove. We thought to celebrate. I was not very politically aware, even though I had over the years a number of Indigenous friends. I spoke to my sister, who lived in Newtown, which is close into the city, and it was, I was a bit shocked when she said, no, she couldn't meet us, she would be marching with the Aboriginal contingent from Redfern. She'd already been and welcomed the bus that had driven all that long way with its complexity and tragedy on the journey, but that's another story. I felt confronted and afraid as I stood at Lady Macquarie's chair. I was confronted by the reality that for some, there was no rejoicing and I was afraid that I might be drawn into some kind of, you know, a fray. My sister, 12 years my senior and unburdened by the trammels of conventional family life, had been aware of the struggles of our Indigenous brothers and sisters for a long time. I'd never thought of what the impact on the First Peoples had been. Yes, I knew that they'd been shot. Yes, I knew there'd been massacres. But it was all a long time ago, wasn't it? And now we live together, happily, didn't we? And then I remembered Indigenous Sharon Smith in my primary school class, whose germs were so contagious that we all wrote 100% SS germ proof on our hands and shunned her in the playground. All this is a long prelude to my point about social media and fear and exclusion. When you look at the debate on social media, on this topic and many others, the rhetoric is vile. It's violent, it's often sexually violent, so that an Aboriginal politician who spoke out, one of the posts that I see, saw offered to gang rape her. And that's, this is an issue that has no bearing on sexuality, or, or, or on which sexuality has no bearing, I should say. It's debased, and it's debasing, and it's full of hatred. Any idea of inclusion, whether it pertains to Indigenous affairs, to refugee matters, to the recognition of sexual abuse victims, to closing the gender gap, or to welfare recipients, any of those things are greeted by an avalanche of hostility. 
The mainstream media straddles the fence with a kind of token gesture towards trying to support the oppressed and give them a voice, while at the same time reporting the reactionary speech and actions of the detractors. And our politicians, both in government and in opposition, play on our fears in order to win votes. We are a society afraid of the other. And that fear results in violent opposition, both verbal and sometimes even physical. When I read that kind of abuse, I feel unclean. I feel tainted by the vitriol of others, even when I don't espouse it. And that, it seems to me, is the fear that we face when confronted by the other. We're frightened of being tainted. We have to write 100% SS germ-proof on our hands. And then the next thing we're frightened of is losing what we have, whatever it is. We feel confronted by the refugee. We don't want to imagine ourselves in his or her shoes, so we hate instead. We feel confronted by the indigenous person and we react by diminishing their humanity and failing to recognise our own complicity while living comfortably on their land. And none of us want to talk about land rights. We feel confronted by the abused women and we don't want to admit the possibility of our own abusive nature. Though the Me Too campaign reveals that many women are now prepared to admit their own abuse. We feel confronted by the homeless person begging on the streets or the mentally ill audibly raving because we all know that there, but for the grace of God, go we. All these people either inhabit the margins of our society or conversely are invisible even when right in the centre. Jesus, on his first excursion after confronting his own complexity in the baptism and confronting his humanity in the wilderness, moves into the centre. He goes to the synagogue in order to stretch his prophetic wings and teach. It is an epiphanic moment for the people around him. Jesus is revealed as one who is different because of his authority. The gathered men, and the word synagogue means gathered together, these men have come ritually clean and ready to be spoken to by their leader. Instead, a young prophet speaks to them, from Isaiah, Luke tells us, with such authority that it terrifies them. They are confronted by the revelation of his words, though Mark doesn't tell us what he said. And then, you know, it gets worse. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and it squawked out, saying, What to us and to you, Jesus Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I have seen who you are, the holy of the God. Now, this really is confrontational, both for Jesus and for the men assembled. It would be confrontational, wouldn't it, if it happened in the middle of our service? Imagine that. And it also raises a lot of questions. Was the man there already pretending to be ritually clean and suddenly the spirit that enslaved him popped out into everyone's view? Did the man rush in from outside? Was he there but on the margins. He was possessed, enslaved, as Mark Davis puts it, in the cage of his illness. And that is Mark Davis's translation that I just read you. This too is revelation. The evil, whatever form it took, was revealed. And in that revelation, the authority of Jesus was also exposed Jesus is named as the holy of the God, or as the NRSV tidies it up, the holy one of God. This is the important 
revelation, the epiphany for us today. Jesus of Nazareth is the Holy One of God. And just incidentally, for those who are interested, that that means me, but anyway, this pericope or chunk of text is chiastic in structure. That means it's, yeah, doesn't matter. Ask me afterwards. And the verse that it turns on is this one. This is what we're supposed to notice, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Holy One of God. This is the revelation. And Jesus responds to the man with the evil spirit. And Jesus censured it, saying, Be silent and come out, out of him. And having convulsed him and having cried out a great cry, the unclean spirit went out of him. The first thing I want you to notice is the separation of the man from the spirit that cages him. Jesus sees this evil spirit as separate from the man. And this, I think, is the first step towards confronting our fear of the other. If we see the thing that entraps a person, their poverty, their mental illness, their addiction, as a cage that the person lives in, we can react to them then without fear. Being addicted, for example, is not contagious. And neither, of course, is poverty. I remember the day that my friend Denise, who some of you have met, who's a psychologist, picked me up. I said, oh, so-and-so is schizophrenic. And she interrupted and she said, no, she has schizophrenia. It's a small distinction. However, it is important. We human beings made in the image of God are sometimes burdened by something, but it doesn't define who we are. We are God's precious children loved by God. But what about those things for whom, those people for whom the thing that separates them is intrinsic so that they're indigenous? they're homosexual, or even perhaps just female. This is fear of difference, fear of the other, and it comes, I think, out of a notion of scarcity. As a woman who has been both feared by men and vilified because of it, I know it's real. All I can say is that God made us. God loves us, male and female, Jew and Greek, slave and and free. And another thing to add to that is that God is the God of generosity, of abundance, and there is room in the kingdom of God for all. We don't have to fear that some other who is different will take our place. The second thing that I think is revealed in the text is that Jesus' power and authority is exercised to bring healing and wholeness. This is inclusion. This reveals God's generosity. Jesus is there to proclaim the kingdom of God. And that's how the Gospel of Mark starts. It says that Jesus is there to proclaim the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a good place for everyone. Jesus works the margins of his society. And we'll see that a lot in Mark. And he brings people into the centre, not the centre of their own community, but the centre of God's kingdom, which is to say, into the centre of love. The crowd in the synagogue react by asking one another who this is. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? The evil spirit has just named him. He said he's Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. But they've got a long way to go before they're convinced. And his fame spreads throughout the region, which leads to certain consequences, both good and bad, as we will explore over the course of the year. Jesus has been revealed. So what holds them back from following him? The crowds flock to him and many are healed. But the men of the synagogue, and I keep saying men, advisedly. 
These men are held back and I would postulate that it is fear that does that. And what about our society? The fear of difference that is expressed in the anger and scorn of people on social media or the fear of difference that's expressed much more quietly in our churches is real. We are all afraid at some level. But Jesus' answer is, do not be afraid. I come to bring you good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus has come to bring healing and wholeness. Jesus speaks to us about love and inclusivity, about God's great generosity to us all. We are called to be people who embrace that glory, the kingdom of God, a place of welcome and of inclusion. We are called also, you know, to be the fearless prophets, like John the baptizer, who take God's message of love into our world. So this week, beloved, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, and it might be necessary this week, use words. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.